first of all, let me start by thanking Thomas, Elio, and Laura for the invitation. It's really great to be here and to learn so much. So this conference has been really uh, very nice, super, you know, interesting. I've learned a lot, and I'm very glad that some of you are staying all the way to Friday to, to listen to what I want to share with you. So I'm going to tell you about um, what I call next generation more air quantum matter. Okay, and I think you know plenty of you might be familiar with just in case you know there are plenty of students. So we have now you know been investigating the physics of strongly correlated electrons and topological physics for you know many decades. Okay, and there are several platforms that you know one can use for for these things. The you know most you know uh, traditional one is to actually look at quantum materials with lattice scales of the order of an Armstrong, okay? And there are many classes of strongly correlated quantum materials, many of which have been discussed here, you know, nictites, cuprates, heavy fermions, et cetera. Now these systems, there are many, many, many of them and many, many phases, but we have relatively little control over the properties of a material once it's, you know, once a crystal is grown, you know, we, we you know, if you wanna change it, typically you have to grow another crystal with a different composition, et cetera. Now, for the past 20 years, another platform that has been very successful at investigating physics of strongly correlated systems has been to use ultra cold atoms in optical lattices. Okay, where people can shine lasers at each other and you can load these uh, periodic potentials with atoms and then you can tune. Here you have exquisite control over all the parameters of the system. Yeah? And you can tune interactions in particular very sensitively. But the problem is that there, you know, it, it's very technically challenging to cool down to very low temperatures that require some of the most exciting phases that people would like to look at. Yeah? And in that sense, you know, although there has been tremendous progress, it is a little bit tricky still to access, for example, the region of superfluidity due to repulsive interactions, you know, they still need to cool down for, you know, for quite a bit. And, uh, you know, we have a few talks about this and, and prospects of this happening. And over the past few years, another platform that has emerged is more quantum matter where the length scale is uh, intermediate between you know, the length scale of typical quantum materials and the length scale of optical lattices is about a couple orders of magnitude from each other. And in this platform, we also have an intermediate degree of control, you know, typically more than for traditional quantum materials, not quite as much control as with the ultra cold atoms in optical lattices, but as you, know, you will see that you know, many, many phases have been realized you know, in these systems, even though we've been exploring these for just a few years. So just in, in the span of the past you know, five years or so, uh, using this Moray quantum matter platform, and, they come, and the name comes from this Moray pattern that forms when you superimpose two periodic lattices with a twist angle between them, or if the lattices do not have, you know, are not identical, you can even get this Moray pattern even at, without any twist between them. But within the span of just a few years, we have been able to realize you know, many, many of the phases of, you know, condensed matter that, that we know, you know, from correlated insulators to exotic superconductors, many different kinds of topological phases, magnetism, quasi-crystals, ferroelectricity, strange metal, vignette crystals, excitonic insulators, pneumatic systems, and the list keeps, you know, growing, you know, every month or two, you know, there's a new phase. So we've been able to realize many of these phases often with very, you know, unconventional character compared to the, the ones that were explored in more traditional quantum materials. So what do I want to tell you about today? I'll briefly introduce, you know, especially for those who are not so familiar, the first generation or single moray quantum matter. But you know, there even here, you know, there are several aspects of, of what one could call next generations because they're more complex than the original one that we studied. And then I'll go to a symmetric moray or dual moray quantum matter where you play more with more than one twist angle, you know, and you see what happens. And I'll tell you in particular about superconductivity and strong interactions in an engineer more across the crystal. And I hope to have time to tell you about an exotic electronic ratchet effect and unconventional type of ferroelectricity in one of these dual more structures. So <clears throat> the, you know, the first, you know, more structure or the, or the one that has been investigated the most is that that consists of twisted ballet graphene, graphene on top of graphene. So when you put two graphene sheets on top of each other, the lattice is identical. Oh, there's something here with the resolution. I don't know what's going on, but. That should stop there. But in general, a moray pattern forms where the moray wavelength, the distance between the soccer balls that you see here in the screen, you know, goes as one over the twist angle, particularly at low angles. Okay, because these lattices are identical, these moray wavelengths can go all the way to infinity. If they were slightly different, the lattices, then it would saturate the maximum moray wavelength. 
Now, this is what happens in real space. The thing Jolo has in the electronic structure this Dirac cone. So let's see what happens to this electronic structure when you twist. So if we start already from a small twist angle, it turns out that the electronic, you know, the, the Dirac cones in reciprocal space are very close to each other, okay? And roughly separated in momentum space by the twist angle, yeah? by, by an amount proportional to the twist angle. And this is the situation that would occur if electrons in one graphene sheet did not know that the other graphene sheet was there. And these energy momentum dispersions would just interpenetrate each other. However, because when we put graphene on top of graphene, these graphene sheets are just three angstroms apart, electrons are very much aware that the other graphene sheet exists, okay? And in particular, they can tunnel between the two graphene sheets. This leads to a band repulsion here, okay? At that crossing point where and it is due to this interlayer tunneling. The situation that is depicted here is when that band repulsion is smaller than the energy of that crossing point. Okay? This is the same thing as bonding and bonding states for a hydrogen molecule, except that this bonding and bonding bands for a giant graphene molecule. Okay? Now, if you decrease the twist angle okay, further, this was already a small twist angle, but if you decrease it further, this band, which gets pushed down a little bit, by the opening of the band gap there. It's pushed down further and further and further until for a certain angle, it touches zero. It becomes a flat band. Yeah? This flat band condition is reached at an angle, which was coined by Bistritzer and McDonald's the magic angle. Depends on this interlayer tunneling. And for graphene on top of graphene at ambient pressure is 1.1 degrees. Okay? And I should mention that there was very interesting work also by Suarez Moray and collaborators on the prediction of these flat bands and by the group of Eva and Dre, the, where she was performing scanning tunnel microscopy. And at the level of single particle physics, you get a von Hoff singularity here. And she was able to detect that the von Hoff singularity as a function of twist angle went to zero. Okay, so there was already very interesting single particle, single particle physics were both experimentally and theoretically about a decade ago on in, you know, in this system. Now, what happened is that you know, so that was, you know, this is a cartoon. This is an actual calculation okay, for a given model, the energy versus momentum for a magic angle twist of a graphene. You have these blue bands, which are the flat bands. These are the other remote you know, bands, which are part of the folding process, you know, the band structure that develops when you fold the bands because of the more structure. And if you put electrons in these flat bands, you know, and you try to go back to real space and see where they like to sit, it turns out, Electrons in these flat bands, they sort of like to sit in certain regions, which we call AA stacking, where locally all of the carbon atoms are in the two layers are on top of each other. Now, in reality, there's a small twist angle, right? So there is a shift in registry as you move in the Moray pattern. So there are regions of AB and BA stacking where A and B refer to the two sub lattices of the honeycomb you know, uh, graphene lattice. And in these regions, the electrons do not like to be. Yeah, so schematically, magic angle twisted by layer graphene looks like this. You have these regions, these, you have this more pattern where you have these AA regions where the electrons like to sit and this ABB8 region where the electrons do not like to be too much. In a slightly more realistic schematic, you have that this more pattern, you know, the real separation between these AA regions, which I shaded here in yellow, is about 13 nanometers, okay? And this is going to form sort of equivalent of a triangular fermi hubbard lattice in cold atoms, okay? Although there are many quotes here, first of all, it's not really triangular, it's a honeycomb, the AB and BA regions are not the same. And it's not a standard fermi hubbard lattice because the topological properties of you know, the electronic structure prevent a direct mapping to the usual vanilla you know, fermi hubbard lattice, you know, in a square lattice, for example. But you, know, you get the idea that this is going to be a little bit analog to that. So then what happens is that if you tune, you know, and we can tune with an electrostatic gate the number of electrons in our system continuously, yeah. So if you tune to a given number of electrons or holes per more unit cell, you can find various correlated states, including correlated insulators. And if you tune with density, you dope a little bit away from them, you can actually find electrically tunable superconductivity. Yeah. And that's what happened you know, a few years ago in, in my group. This is only happening in a relatively narrow angular range around this magic angle. Yeah. Something between one and 1 1.2 or maybe 0 0.95 to 1.25 when all of these physics happens, although of course, as now we are finding other more structured other systems, you know, these, these angles are changing and, and I'll show that in a moment. So this, you know, this um, construction of 
trying to get flat bands, you know, by twisting the thin layers, you know, was generalized by the group of us in this one of in 2019. Turns out there is a something, you know, you can call it magic angle multi-layer graphene with an alternating twist structure where you put consecutive layers on top of each other with an angle theta minus theta, theta minus theta, theta minus theta, and you go like that. Yeah? So there is a single twist angle or single moiré pattern. Okay? And this hierarchy, you know, you have here number of layers versus magic angle hierarchy. This parameter alpha goes as one over the twist angle. Yeah? So for two layers, you have the first magic angle, which is this 1.1 degree. Then there is a second magic angle, third, fourth magic angle. No one has seen those experimentally, but they're predicted there. We don't know if they're stable. We know that the first one is stable. Then for three layers, you also have first, second, third magic angle, et cetera. Starting from four layers, you have the first, first magic angle, the second, first magic angle, but you have also the first, second magic angle, et cetera. There's a hierarchy, a tree, okay, of electronic structures that happen for different angles in which you always have a flat pan and then you have additional electronic structure. Yeah? So the system is such that if you do a rotation, you, know, you rotate your Hamiltonian and you choose the appropriate basis, you always get a block diagonal Hamiltonian where you always get a flat pan due to you know, an analog of magic angle twisted by layer graphene. And then you have as many large angle twisted by layer graphene sectors, you know, blocks as even numbers of, you know, layers you have in your system. And in addition, monolayer graphene sector, if you have an odd number of layers in total. Yeah? So the electronic structures for, you know, for two layers, you know, the magic angle is about 1.1 degrees. You have just a flat band. For three layers, you have the flat band plus a monolayer Dirac cone. For four layers, you have the flat band and a large angle twisted by layer graphene block. For five layers, you have flat bands, large twist angle plus monolayer Dirac cone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what um, my group and the group of Philip Kim, you know, discovered, you know, now two years ago is, you know, what we call more magic 3.0. So if you make, you know, put three layers of two, you know, of alternating graphene at the magic angle for three layers, which is different, you know, it's 1.56 degrees roughly, then you get strongly, you know, coupled superconductivity, okay? In both groups will obtain very similar results. You can do this with four and five layers, you know, and also the group of, um, you know, the group of Stefan Natsperch, my group, the group of uh, Emmanuel Dutuk, we all discovered that indeed, if you have four and five layers, you also get a robust superconductor. So this more superconductors is a family of superconductors, okay, of which there are many members, you know, four at least already experimentally realized, okay, but likely, you know, is you put more layers following the same recipe. It's a very good chance that it will continue. You know, in particular, the superconductivity seems to get a little bit more robust the more layers you actually put on top of each other. Okay, so that's why we think that probably you can extend this to any number of layers. So this is relatively old news. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about it to set the context. Let me tell you uh, about um, dual more quantum matter. Okay, I'm going to start with quasi crystals. So. As you'll know, a quasi crystal is a solid which has long range order, but not, which is not periodic. Yeah? And there are many examples of quasi crystals. You know, some of them, are, for example, this Penrose tiling. You know, you take a diffraction pattern, you see spots, okay, discrete points. That tells you that there is order, but the system is actually not periodic. Okay, the system doesn't repeat itself. So another example is twisted by layer graphene. Okay, in general, for arbitrary angles, these are incommensurate. Yeah. And when you look at the set of dots that reflect where the carbon atoms are for any arbitrary angle, this pattern never repeats itself. Okay, so this is a quasi-periodic system. In general, if you want a, a criterion for for what is a quasi-crystal, what is not, you know, if you have long range order, but and it's periodic, this is a crystal. If you have long range order and it's not periodic, then it's a quasi-crystal or quasi-periodic crystal, okay? And a more you know, mathematical definition is that if the number of lattice vectors, which is often called the rank, okay, that you need to describe your lattice is larger than the dimension of the space you live in, then this thing is a quasi-crystal, okay? So for example, magic angle graphene is a rank four quasi-crystal. You, know, you need four lattice vectors at least if, if you neglect the Z offset, okay, to describe your lattice, but you live in two dimensions or you need five, you know, in three dimensions, okay? So quasi-crystals, you, know, you know, they're not 
you know, many, many studies of quasi crystals. And the reason is that, you know, there are you know, not too many of them. Theoretically, they are hard to deal with, right? You don't even have blocks theorem to get started, okay? Which is like chapter one in, in any solid state physics book. However, you know, despite these difficulties, many, you know, theoretical proposals have predicted interesting effects which can happen in a variety of quasi crystals and quasi periodic systems, okay? Specifically, you know, various types of interesting topological properties and unconventional types of superconductivity. So with, you know, more super lattices, we can engineer and tune many things, as I just mentioned a moment ago, okay? In particular, twisted by layer graphene at 30 degrees angle is a dodecagonal quasi crystal. It was nice work done by Philip Kim and collaborators in Korea um, on this subject. However, although it is a structurally a quasi crystal, the electrons, at least in experiments that we can do in transport, do not realize, you know, all the quasi crystallinity is at very small scales, meaning at very high energies, and you don't have access to these quasi crystalline properties in any transport experiment or any experiment that, you know, uh, many labs would do, except for the structural T and type of studies. Yeah? Now, we can rotate, you know, basically from the electronic point of view, these two layers are electronically decoupled, okay, because all the crossing of these direct cones is at super high energy. You can rotate this so that these Dirac cones come closer and physics, you know, gets hybridized at low energies, as I mentioned, you know, in the case of magic angle twisted by layer graphene. But even then, the electrons do not realize that they live in a quasi crystal system. Okay, what the electrons actually see, yeah, so this is twisted by layer graphene. You see the scale here, 10 nanometers. So this is roughly magic angle, okay? It's an atomic structure. From the atomic structure point of view, this is a rank four quasi crystal. But what the electrons see is this. They see a periodic more crystal, yeah? And that's why I can plot the type of band structure that I plot, you know, a few slides ago, about magic angle graphene, et cetera. The electrons think that they live in a periodic crystal. They don't notice this quasi crystallinity, yeah? So, what can we try to do to explore a bit more this, this you know, quasi crystal type of aspect? So one thing that we thought of that we could do is the following. We can take, you know, we can use more, the more lattice itself as a building block for the quasi crystallinity. So we can take another twist angle. We can take, you know, twisted by graphene at a different twist angle. The electrons, again, here a rank for quasi crystal, but the electrons will see a periodic crist more crystal, okay? But we can choose this twist angle and this twist angle to be slightly different. Yeah? Then we can put them on top of each other. In particular, we're going to make just a three layer structure where the middle layer is just shared. Okay? And then what happens is that we will have these two moiré patterns on top of each other. So we're going to form a moiré quasi crystal, where the quasi crystallinity is in the moiré pattern, not in the atomic scale lattice. Okay? So this will be a rank four moiré quasi crystal because it is composed of two periodic more crystals, but which are rotated with respect to each other, okay? So how do we do, you know, I mean, and, and this, of course, the nice thing is that we can choose now the more as the building block rather than the atomic you know, structure. We can engineer this in various ways, you know, because we have a lot of flexibility with how we choose these more patterns. The density scale associated with these things is very small, which means it's accessible, you know, within typical transport experiments, you know, you can, you know, uh, tune the density in the region where it's of interest to access this quasi crystallinity. Yeah, it's tunable using electrostatic gates. And as you will see, you know, we have also, you know, tunable electron interactions and other things. So, in order to do this, what we did is what I just mentioned. We choose, you know, we build, you know, three layers of graphene, we stack them on top of each other rather than choosing theta minus theta for the, as for the magic angle alternating twist, we're going to choose. Theta one two, theta two three, where theta one two and theta two three are different now, yeah, a little bit different. I'll tell you later how different we want it to be or not. So this is the structure, and we have okay. This structure is has a bottom metallic plate and a top metallic plate with which this you know trilayer forms parallel plate capacitors, so that applying two voltages we can control the density in the three layers and independently the electric field. The transverse electric field that can polarize your wave functions, you know, in the three layers. So if you measure the resistivity versus displacement field and total density, okay, you have a pattern like this. I don't know if you, you know, I went a little bit fast, but if you, you know, think about the 
alternating twist structure, the symmetric one, that was symmetric up and down. Now, because the two angles, theta one, two, and theta two, three are not the same, this is not symmetric, you know, top and bottom, okay? Of course, because the angles are different. Now, here we see a number of features, okay? And these features allow us to identify what is, the, what are the twist angles involved, you know, in the structure, okay? So in particular, you, know, you take a trace to here, you have various features here. Take a trace to here, you have other features. Take a trace to here, you have other features, okay? So how do we extract the twist angles that are involved in the structure? We can look at this feature, okay? This is a feature which happens when we polarize with displacement field and density such that we mostly, in a trace going through this, the top layer is mostly unoccupied and we're shifting through, you know, you know, we're binding the density such that we occupy these two layers and we go through the current, you know, through the band insulated state, which corresponds to filling nu equals four. You know, we've been hearing a lot of fillings one, two, three, four, you know, over the past few days. Okay. So the, the band insulator, the nu equals four state here. This should be an insulator, except that of course you have the charge neutrality point from the top layer still conducting. So it's not full insulator, but it's still a highly resistive state, which corresponds to the band insulator for these bottom two layers. Okay. And that's how we know that we have a certain angle, 1.4 degrees, okay? Because this density corresponds to 1.4 degrees for a filling of the bottom two layers. We can, in the same way, polarize the system with displacement field and with density such that now it is the top two layers which we're looking at. When do we go through the band insulator state for the top two layers? Because the bottom layer is mostly unoccupied. And that tells us that that angle is actually 1.9 degrees. And because we know we assemble them with alternating twist, okay? Not identical, but alternating. We know that this is actually minus 1.9 degrees. Yeah? So now we have the two more patterns, okay? The two more unit cells, they're different. And that's what forms a rank form one quasi crystal. So if we apply a little bit of a magnetic field, okay? In this case, one Tesla, we can see that the Landau level structure and a set of crossings of Landau levels appears, okay? Which you can see here. and you know, if you look at in, in reciprocal space, you have, you know, the, the, the direct cones of each of the layers, okay? And they're rotated and they're rotated by angles, you know? This, you know, you zoom in there, you can see the, the more unit cells spanned by layers one and two and by layers one and three. And as a result, you have these three direct cones, which they don't form the flat bands of magic angle trilayer of theme because they're not at the magic angle condition, okay? But they are strongly, Fermi velocity, the Fermi velocities are renormalized by the interaction between adjacent Dirac cones, okay? By the tunneling between the electrons in adjacent layers, even if you're not at the magic angle condition. So you can actually zoom in here and you can see that there's a lot of structure here. Okay, you have in particular three sets of Landau levels which come from each of these three Dirac cones. And you can actually do an analysis of all of this and get the renormalized Fermi velocities. You don't get all three Fermi velocities, but you get the ratios, okay, of Fermi velocity one to three and two to three. And as you can see, they're strongly renormalized. Okay? So we have system where the three layers are quite coupled. Their Fermi velocities are renormalized, okay, but they still maintain a layer character because they're not fully hybridized like in the magic angle condition. So <clears throat> you cannot calculate the band structure, but you can calculate the spectral function, okay, for this type of quasi-periodic systems, okay? So in a trace that goes from K3 to K1 to K2, where these are the K points of each of the layers, you can calculate how many states are present at each momentum, you know, at, at a given energy. And what you can see, okay, here you can see that, you know, these are K3, K1, and K2. This color scales here is telling you whether they're mostly on layer one, layer two, or layer three, or hybridized in between. And what you can see is that there is a region near zero Fermi energy where the system seems, you know, the electron seems to see three layer polarized data cones, okay? they roughly, they almost look like periodic structure would look like a periodic band structure would look. And then you have these other regions where you have a spaghetti of flat bands. There is where the quasi crystallinity is manifest and the electrons will see it, yeah? In addition, you have to higher energies, a fast band which sort of retains its character, you know, because it's a little bit more coupled, okay? Because one of the angles is a bit larger than the other. So in this region, the electrons are going to think they're in a periodic system. In this region, the electrons are going to see that they're in a quasi-periodic system. Yeah? So if you look again at this 
you know, quantum oscillations, yeah, resistivity versus displacement field and density in a finite magnetic field near zero Fermi energy, near charge neutrality, the system exhibits three sets of periodic oscillation, quantum oscillations because the system sees these three you know, periodic like electronic structures. If you go away in Fermi energy to this region, then these quantum oscillations mostly disappear. Only the one that corresponds to this fast band, which is still kind of present there, remains. Okay. Now, in this system, you can calculate okay, the density of states. And as you can imagine, this region of you know, flat spaghetti you know, of quasi bands gives you a very high density of states. Yeah? This high density of states, you know, when you now measure the whole density of the system, yeah, and you can do this as a function of displacement field and density, there is a lot of information here. I encourage you to go to the paper if you want to know more details. But basically, this type of analysis of the whole density were done in the magic angle trilayer case to determine the presence of Hankov singularities and Fermi surface reconstructions, which lead to a reset okay, of, the, of the whole density, which you know, some people actually spoke about this yesterday. But if you take a trace here, you can see you know, your, your whole density versus the gate-induced density should be a straight line. Okay, and you can have things like function singularities, and you can have things like resets where you deviate from this linearity. Okay, these are due to strong interactions and typically symmetry breaking phase transitions in your spin and value degrees to freedom. If you look at this, you know, at zero magnetic field and at lower temperature, okay, your resistivity, you find this region. This is where the flavor of symmetry phase transition takes place. And you can see that on both sides of this, you actually have. Su superconductivity, okay? So you have superconductivity in this quasi-periodic system and it happens around, you know, where the phase transition happens due to strong interactions, okay? Which is kind of similar to what happens in magic angle twisted by graphene and other systems, though it has a little bit different character. Okay, so this twisted trilayer graphene is a novel platform for more quasi crystals, okay? If you, right here, theta one, two and theta two, three in general, okay? You can go in the alternating direction or in the chiral direction, all angles in the same direction, okay, to make like a staircase. Okay, and of course you can do this with three, but you can do this with any number of layers. So where are we going to find these quasi-crystals? Okay. So it turns out, well, so magic angle twisted bilayer again, because bilayer, it's it has, you know, it's a point on this axis. There's no theta two, three, just theta one, two. Magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, the alternating one, has the same angle here and here, one, about 1.6 degrees. I mean, 1.6 and then minus 1.6, same angle but alternating, opposite sign. Twisted monolayer bilayer graphene, another correlated system, is also only has, only has one angle. In general, if you want to predict where more aquasic crystals are going to form, you have to look at what is the separation of length scales of the different lengths involved in the system, okay? So this parameter gamma, which is related you know, to what is the minimum ratio of length scales in your system while keeping this gamma greater than one, okay? And this is for length scales, which are the atomic length scale and the more length scales given by the more pattern between layers one and two, two and three, and one and three. So for example, in magic angle twisted by layer graphene, the atomic scale, you know, the lattice is you know, two angstroms, the more wavelength is 13 nanometers, gamma lambda m over a is much, much greater than one. In that case, when there's a large separation of length scales, you get actually a periodic more crystal, okay? In the case that I just showed you, 1.4 minus 1.9 degrees, these are the relevant length scales. This parameter gamma, okay, the minimum ratio of length scales is actually close to one, okay? Under those conditions, you get a more quasi crystal. So if you look here, at when are you going to get a more periodic crystal or a more quasi crystal, turns out, okay, purple, which is close to one for gamma, is more quasi crystal. Most of the phase space is actually spanned by more quasi crystals rather than, you know, more crystals like here, magic angle, bilayer, or trilayer around this direction. Okay. So you can look at the spectral function in point, you know, point A there, B there. C, D, E, F, G, you know, various points. All of these have different spectral functions with different distribution of flat bands and different topological properties, actually. Okay, so there's a lot to explore here. And I can already tell you that there will be interesting stuff happening in some regions in this, you know, 
I mean, it's, I, I know that there is, okay? So we're doing experiments and there is interesting stuff in other regions of this, you know, uh, phase space. Okay, so just in the last, you know, 10 minutes or so, let me tell you about um, this, you know, new effect that we have discovered in, 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 in another layer contrasting model structure. And this ties very nice with the subject, with many of the talks that have been uh, given during the conference, in particular with the talk of uh, Roser Valenti yesterday, for example. So, in, you know, a theme that has been, you know, very present in the conference is the role of itinerant versus localized electrons, or the fact that in many systems you have both localized and itinerant electrons, okay? Itinerant electrons are responsible for things like superconductivity, and they play a major role also in topology, you know, conduction through edge states. Localized electrons, you know, lead to various types of correlative insulators, you know, and they're very important, you know, in the Hubbard model and the Hafelian, et cetera. And then systems like heavy fermions, you know, and, you know, physics and condo physics and unconventional superconductivity, which comes from doping, for example, a multi insulator, you know, both localized and itinerant electrons play an important role. Okay? Now, in this more super lattices, we can, you know, engineers studying control, you know, many of these you know, many faces and many things, one of them is we can control this type of character of it, you know, those localized electrons. In particular, you know, many groups have been studying superconductivity and also the topological properties of, you know, magic angle twisted by layer graphene, which, you know, reflects this, you know, itinerant character of the electrons. But many groups have also been studied, you know, for example, um, transition metal dicacogenite twisted TMD heterostructures, okay? where you get more than generic linear crystals and other phases, which tells you that you know, the electrons are localized. Now, there's, for a, a year or two now, there's mounting and mounting evidence that electrons in magic angle twisted by graphene exhibit both characters, itinerant and localized, okay? There was, for example, this paper by, you know, Shahalilani and, 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 you know, a similar paper by Andrea Young and also the group of um, Ali Yazari for STM, and by now, actually, many other groups where, we can understand certain properties of magic graphene by thinking that electrons in magic graphene are localized, and other properties by thinking that electrons are actually itinerant. Yeah. In this very nice paper by Andre Bernevik and, and and Roser again spoke about this yesterday morning. You know, this picture is from from Ramirez. They propose this topological heavy condo fermion, which you know materializes. You know, very, you know, very vividly. You know, explains. Very, very nice explains how you can have these both characters, you know, this localized, you know, heavy fermion band, you know, and this itinerant band and how they hybridize and they give you the one structure of magic angle twisted by graphene very accurately. Okay. So in the case of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, as I just told you, you have right away, you know, at the, you know, very in a in a very explicit way also the flat bands and the massless dirac cone, you know, coexisting in the same electronic system. So you also have that character. And in transition metal dicacogenites, you know, this paper by the group of Jishan and Kifai Mack, but many others by now also, are showing that you can have these gate tunable heavy fermions in a more condo lattice. So again, you have character of, you know, localized and itinerant electrons in the same system. So let me tell you about a more system, okay, where this is also displayed and in a very dramatic way. So this is a system where we're going to have coexistence of localized and itinerant electrons, and there's an unexpected coupling between them. And the effect that results is a more electron ratchet. So let me show you what I mean. The system is going to be Bernal by layer graphene, no twist angle, just zero angle between the two layers, okay, in a Bernal stacking, the usual by layer graphene Bernal, aligned, okay, on one side to hexane boronitride and misalign on the other side, okay? So it's a layer contrasting asymmetric, you know, more heterostructure. So Bernal by layer graphene with natural you know, stacking. And this is going to be sandwiched between hexagonal boronitride with different alignment to the graphene layers. Okay. And again, with the dual gate structure. So sort of by also kind of magic, it turns out that a hexagonal boronitride has a lattice which is very close to that of Latin, uh, of graphene, just a little bit different. And if you align the two lattices, graphene and hexagonal rubber nitride, the Moret pattern also happens to have 13 nanometers wavelength, similar to magic and graphene. But what I'm going to say is unrelated to that, okay? Just don't get confused by seeing the same 13. I'm talking now about graphene to HBN Moret lattice. Okay, so if you have regular bilayer graphene, 
with no alignment to the HVM, okay? And you measure the resistance as a function of back gate and top gate. Then you see this diagonal line where this diagonal line is actually the, the charge neutrality point, the resistance peak, okay? Resistance is low in this region, high in this region, okay? And it's high here and it gets higher when you go away along this charge neutrality, charge neutrality line when you apply a displacement field because a band gap opens here when you break the symmetry between the two layers. Yeah? This has been measured by, it was first theoretically proposed by uh, Castro and collaborators and measured by Alberto Morpurgo and collaborators. And this has been seen thousands of times. Yeah. Now, let me show you what happens if you have bilayer graphene in this layer contrasting more structure, okay? So if you measure, and by the way, this, this the reason why you have this diagonal line, okay, is because with the two gates, you're controlling you know, the, the, the angle of this straight line is that gives you the ratio between the capacitances to the top gate and to the bottom gate in this, you know, heterostructure where you have this another top gate and bottom gate so that you maintain charge neutrality, zero charge density as you vary the displacement field. Yeah? So displacement field goes in this direction, density goes in this direction, so to speak. And this angle is given by the ratio of the capacitances, basically the distances to the top and bottom gates. So if you do this for bilayer graphene in a layer more, in a layer contrasting more structure, you get this, okay? So you get this region near, in this case, you know, zero, zero, where even though I'm adding carriers to my system, okay? If I, if I sweep the back gate, what I see is a resistance peak, resistance peak, I vary the top gate, I'm adding carriers to my system, but they don't seem to matter, okay? Transport characteristics remain the same, okay? We used to call this, the gate is not working, okay? Like the top gate's not working. We thought it was disconnected because even though I vary it, the characteristics of the system don't change. But then we, you know, we extended the range of the top gate and we saw that it actually was working. It was only in this middle region, which it appeared not to be working, okay? Now, gate not working is not very fancy, so we call this the layer-specific anomalous screening, you know, which happens in this region, this region, and these regions, okay? We published this a few years ago. It has been reproduced by other groups, okay? Now, at the beginning, we were very puzzled, and we thought, like, maybe, indeed, the gate is not working, and there are some charge traps or some crap, with, you know, who knows, right? But then you do this, and you start seeing it in many and many devices uh, to the point that now we can actually engineer to make sure it happens, and so on. So we know that it's not just some gate not working stuff, okay? So these are four different devices and we have many more. Okay, so let me, let's me let examine this a bit more closely. So what happens in, the, in this layer contrasting or symmetric more structure, one of the graphene sheets is aligned to the HBN and forms a long wavelength more pattern, 13 nanometers, okay? The other graphene sheet is misaligned to the HBN. So you have a top more, which is long wavelength and a bottom more, which is actually very, very short wavelength because you know, if you have a large angle between the bottom graphene and the HBN, that more wavelength is, you know, or the nanometer is very short, okay? But this particular device, it's 0, 0,15 degrees. Most of the devices we have examined was 0, 0,30 degrees, okay? So this system has these regions, which we, I call two and four, where the behavior of the system is what you would expect, okay? This diagonal line with the ratio of capacitances given by you know, with, the, with an angle given by the ratio of the capacitances. And it has these regions one, three, and five, where it deviates, the most dramatic being region three, where it's vertical, okay? The location of the charge neutrality point versus the dual gates, okay? The system can be thought of as two systems. One system, which is related to the long wavelength moiré pattern, where you have charge localized and you form, you know, equivalent like hover bands-like structure, okay? And then the other system, which is related to the bottom interface, where your electrons are just bilayer graphene-like, okay? Gagula bilayer graphene-like. Okay? So in your electronic system now, there seems to be these two population of carriers. When you measure transport, you are only looking at what happens with the itinerant electrons. Okay? The localized electrons don't contribute to transport. So even if something is happening in the localized electrons, you don't see it because in transport, you only measure the thing that is moving, okay? If you do whole measurements, the same thing, okay? The carrier density is telling you about the itinerant electrons, not about the localized electrons. But let me show you what type of interplay happens between the localized and the itinerant electrons. And by the way, 
you know, again, this notion that, you know, there is, you know, localized anhydrin electrons has been proposed by many people. So one thing that we can do is we can measure the whole density, okay, along this trace here, okay, this white dash trace. And then we can assume that Maxwell's equations work and that, you know, our gates are inducing, you know, electrostatic density in the system and calculate what, you know, so this is the electrostatic density which should be induced by the gates, okay? If the gates are actually working. And therefore the difference between these two systems is giving you the localized density. As you can see in regions two and four, you know, the system, the localized system is not being charged, okay? And it's the itinerant system that is being charged in region one, three, and five. The reason why this trace repeats itself is because we are not adding with the gates charge to the itinerant system, but we're adding it to the localized system. Okay? So we're adding charge to the system, but it's to the localized system, and therefore in transport, we don't see a difference. Okay? In fact, we can analyze this and look at, you know, where do electrons go into the, you know, where in this phase diagram they go into the localized system, where do they go into the itinerant system, yeah? And along this charge neutrality line, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, we have these regimes where every time it is, you know, a Hubbard band which is being filled, you have this layer anomalous screening, so in regions one, three, and five, and when you have normal type of behavior, in normal in quotes, you will see now that it's not normal at all, okay? It is, you know, your, your hover bands have already been filled and you have to wait, you know, till you go to the next hover band. So let me show you the most dramatic manifestation of what happens here, okay? Let's assume that we go to the edge here between three and four. I'm going to vary the top gate, so along the white dashed line, but I've, I'm starting from the corner between three and four. I have just finished, you know, filling the hover band responsible for behavior three, okay? And now I'm going to, so that's a six volt stop gate. I'm going to start from six volt stop gate. You know, I measure this whole density and I'm going to now increase the top gate voltage. I'm going in this direction up along this dash line, okay? I increase the top gate voltage. I'm adding now carriers to my itinerant system and it shows in the whole density, the whole density increases. I stop here, okay, at about eight volts. And now I decide I'm going to lower my gate voltage, which I just increased from six to eight. I'm going to go back to six. You would expect I'm just going to undo what I just did. However, what happens is if I decrease the voltage, the whole density remains fixed. I don't undo what I just did. The number of carriers in the itinerant system, the whole density stays fixed. So that's very odd. So let me now increase again. And in fact, I'm going to go to top gate voltage 10 volts. I do that. And this is what happens. It goes through, it retraces back this until it reaches the point where it was before. And then it increases like this. And you're like, oh, well, let me just undo. If you undo, it does, this is what it does, okay? And then I can do this again, and I can do this. It is as if I can add systems, I can add carriers to my itinerant system, but I cannot get them out of my itinerant system, okay? So this forms, and you can do, by the way, the same thing with holes. If you go with, uh, at the corner between two and three, you can do the exact same thing, and this thing happens, okay? So this is forming a electronic ratchet, okay? For electrons or for holes, where you can add carriers to the itinerant system, electrons for holes, but you cannot take them away from the itinerant system, okay? In fact, what you're doing is you're taking them away from the localized system. Yeah? And that's why your whole density stay constant. Yeah? So this is how it works. You know, at top gate six volts, we had just filled the hover band corresponding to electrons. Now we wanted to increase a little bit the voltage, but there is a large energy penalty to put, you know, two charges on this hover band, okay, on a, on a side. So what happens is that you feel an electron in the itinerant system, okay? The whole density increases because now you're increasing density in the internal system. If you now undo, okay, reduce the voltage, rather than taking away that itinerant electron that you put, that you just put, what happens is that you take away a localized electron. The gate which is working, all of this is the top gate. The first thing that it says is the moray interface with a long wavelength moray pattern. 
And energetically, what it does is it takes away an electron from the localized system. The same thing you can do with holes, okay? Now, that may seem very odd, and indeed it is, okay? Let me show you something which is perhaps even odder. If we now go back to char all the way to charge neutrality, what we see in the system is that there is a remnant charge separation, okay? We generate dipolar excitons, such that the system, whether it's in the whole ratchet or the electron ratchet, becomes like that. And in fact, we can drive the ratchet further and going back to neutrality and zero displacement field, we're left with a system where we have a number of electron hole pairs, which we can vary at will, okay? The way this process takes place is explained here. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip it, but the, the paper is art. It's posted in the archive, you can look at it. You can do this in larger steps or, or up to further displacement field and you can generate pairs, okay, of electrons or holes, okay? So this remnant separation, which is measured through hole measurements, gives you a type of unconventional ferroelectricity when you have these hysteresis loops, okay? Which are continuously growing, you know, by applying this displacement field further and further, okay? In a regular ferroelectric, the whole structure changes. There's a structural transition and your electric dipole moment goes from, let's say, up to down, all of it, okay? In this structure, we're adding these dipolar excitons continuously, okay? And as a result, we can get any size of hysteresis loop that we want, okay? This is a ferroelectric with a continuously tunable electric dipole moment. Hmm? We can study this you know, as a function of displacement field. Turns out, we believe, okay, so now from that on is interpretation, we believe that this is something, that realizes something called excitonic ferroelectricity in a very different way that it was originally proposed. In the first paper I read this Russian paper, which I only became aware of very recently, and by Lusham had a paper in 1996, where they said, if you have, the Lusham paper in particular says, if you have a 3D material, which has a flat band, who's thinking of some heavy fermion like flat band, okay, F electrons, and also thinner than the electrons, you can form electron hole pairs between the localized, you know, F electron and the tinnitant and D electron and form, you know, these excitons, which will give rise to ferroelectricity. For that, you need the strong interactions and you need these different characters of these charges. So, although we don't think or we're not sure that we realize that particular model, you know, we have flat bands, you know, we have tinnitant and localized electrons and we have strong interactions and we think realizing that. Some people have noticed or have told me, oh, but wait a moment, you're already breaking the symmetry to start with because you have these different you know, potential, you know, these different twist angles, okay? Yes, but that is a weak, you know, symmetry breaking structure or field, you know. I can flip between electric dipole moment up or down without flipping the structure, you know, it's always for the same structure, okay? So the electronic system doesn't experience that symmetry breaking field other than to orient the dipoles. Okay, so, and let me just tell you that the last, this is the last slide, you know, you can program this thing continuously, you know, this is a pro continuously programmable memory of states, you know, because you can add the excitons one by one and you have a continuous distribution of, you know, you can continue to change your electric dipole, you know, so you can build a memory state, not just with two states, but with, you know, effectively infinite, you know, very large number of states, okay, at least 500 we have realized here. This trick, by the way, can be realized also with other structures, for example, with magic and field, and you can have a bistable more superconductor, where now you switch between superconducting and non-superconducting state in this bistable manner. You can do it with many other materials and systems to mix ferroelectricity with other orders that you're interested in. And with this, I want to acknowledge my group members, lots of collaborators. This last ferroelectricity thing was in particular done in very close collaboration with Chorma's group at Boston College and thank, you know, funders. I'm glad we can get back to this type of events and I want to thank you all for your attention.